Okay, so this has been a weird time for everyone. We've been shaken out of our everyday routines, and many of us who aren't on the front lines are finding ourselves at home a lot. And on top of that, in front of our screens a lot. When I'm not working from home, I've been watching a lot of old movies, feeling nostalgic for old stories, playing a lot of video games, keeping up with social media, and doing a lot of browsing. Since most of the world has been told to stay home, there's been a big shift in how we think about our screen time. For the past 30 years, we've been living in the middle of a media panic about TV and video games and mobile devices. Everyone's been afraid of what they're doing to our brains. There have been media panics around every new form of media. There is one for movies, for books, and even the written word. But even though we're all used to being told our whole lives that TV and video games are rotting our brains, now suddenly everyone, including the WHO, even after their controversial move to recognize the so-called gaming disorder diagnosis last year, is recommending games and other media for their positive impact on our psychological well-being during this stressful time. Now that we've been cornered as a society into really looking at the research that tells us moderate screen time isn't actually bad for us, it seems that we're finally admitting something to ourselves that no one felt comfortable saying before. Some screen time is good for us. Within the past few months, more and more people are writing about the positive effects moderate screen time has had on their mental health during these strange times. However, some people I know are feeling a little lost. They know online media is helping them, they often feel better after a media encounter, but they're not quite sure how and have trouble keeping in touch with their feelings while engaging with the media that's calming them down. This isn't new, we've all been pretty confused about our media habits for decades and crack jokes about it. We usually just pick stuff to watch or play based on operant conditioning and hope it improves our mood and helps us relax a little after a long day. Even if sometimes we end up browsing Netflix for 40 minutes until we just watch YouTube videos on our phone. And sometimes we get to the end of a media-filled day on our screens and we feel like we've wasted every second and have no idea why we did it. Now more than ever, we might need to learn more about our relationship with media through media psychology. I argue that we aren't wasting our time or rotting our brains. We are much more productive than we think we are with our screen time, and we can actually unlock a lot more benefits if we learn some media mindfulness techniques. Using media psychology research, I'm going to look at what's going on in our minds when we engage with our screens, and how to get the most out of our time with media emotionally and psychologically by using media mindfulness. The best way I can do that is by using my own media habits as an example. So after I'm done laying down the groundwork, I'll share my embarrassing quarantine watch history with you and walk us through what psychological benefits I've been gaining and maybe you'll see some similarities with your own media habits. So this isn't a typical video for me, I usually review psychological benefits of video games and movies, but this channel is really about media mindfulness. Checking in with our emotions, moods, and psychological needs before, during, and after a media encounter. Most importantly, recognizing our times with stories as opportunities to learn or rest. Media mindfulness, I believe, is the key to naturally adopting healthier media habits and enriching our experiences with our favorite films and games. Usually we treat media like mindless entertainment, and if a piece of work shakes us up, we might do some digging, watch an analytical review about how it was made, discuss it with others, and then stop there and move on to the next media experience. With media mindfulness, we can be better at extracting the meaning from media in a way that's unique to ourselves. We can look at our media encounters to gain important insights into who we are and our needs. With all that said, I've been in front of a lot of screens for several hours for work and leisure, and have I been practicing media mindfulness? Not really. I know it's awful, but that's what this video is for. I'm still learning how to implement these practices in my own life as well. After all, none of us were ever taught this in school, and this is a new field of study in general. Of course, application will take time and practice. So I'm going to be using this video as a demonstration and a chance to practice how to retrospectively analyze my recent media habits to check in with my psychological and emotional needs. Okay, let's get started. First, it's important to realize that we subconsciously use media to fulfill psychological needs, and it's equally important to recognize the psychological context we are in when we choose what we want to watch or play. While I say media helps us fulfill needs, that doesn't mean media could or should replace other resources in our real lives that feed our emotional needs. There is such a thing as too much of a good thing. 
Instead of looking at our screen time as inherently good or bad, or that we need to count minutes like calories, go on trendy media diets, or try to medicate ourselves with even more screen time, this is just about analyzing the media habits we already have and act on naturally. Our end goal is not to change behavior, but to understand our behavior. Understanding ourselves will naturally lead to change. As for the psychological context of my recent media habits, I've been kinda stressed. Like everyone, I'm a little scared and anxious about the state of the world and the well-being of my loved ones, so that means I'm gonna have very different psychological needs right now, and that also might be why I've been watching some embarrassing things. According to self-determination theory, our psychological needs are always in flux. We build them up and spend our mental energies throughout the day on our real-life responsibilities, after which we need to build them up again. These psychological needs include agency, autonomy, relatedness, or self-esteem, to name a few. We fulfill these needs and regain energy with our hobbies, and one of the most efficient places to get these needs fulfilled would be through our media interactions. So, I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing New Horizons. You might have heard about this game that's taken the world by storm with its sweetness. I've made a video about the psychological benefits of playing Animal Crossing too. I love the previous Animal Crossing game, and so I knew I was going to be investing some hours into it, but I didn't know I was going to be spending so many hours so soon. This game has a lot of what we're looking for right now. It's an oasis, away from all the fear. Logging in every day to do the same tasks and decorate, I get the healing rewards of routine, stability, and feelings of agency. I can momentarily feel in control of my environment again, a crucial psychological need for our well-being. And I can also express myself using decorations and character customization that helps me with some therapeutic self-discovery and identity play that also aids my psychological recovery from stress. Also, the social aspect of the game has been really nice. I love visiting other islands and sharing fruit and flowers and exchanging items. It helps me fulfill my need for connection and relatedness that has been thwarted lately by quarantine. And of course, one of the biggest selling points of this game, psychologically, is that high hedonic valence. It's so beautiful, soothing, sweet, and gentle. It immediately calms my nerves and lowers my heart rate. And after playing, I feel lighter, calmer, and rested enough to get back to tackling the emotional hurdles of real life. I've also been playing other little idle games, puzzle games, and number games. People poke fun, but these are also very calming and help me recover from stress. They offer very light challenge as well as give me a healing sense of flow that energizes me and provides me feelings of mastery and accomplishment, again feeding my psychological need to feel competent and in control of something during these chaotic times. It's also important to note what we're choosing not to engage with. Knowing what we don't want can teach us something about our mental state too. I've been meaning to play a lot of other games, including the Witcher series, and although I have a bit more spare time and I still want to someday, I can't bring myself to play something with such high, excitatory potential and requires any kind of long-term mental investment. I've been too exhausted cognitively from work and emotionally for obvious reasons. Since I want to take the Witcher game seriously, I know I'll need to engage deeply and use mental energy to play. If I tried to play, it would become a source of stress in and of itself. Instead, I've been needing a lot of passive play or watching experiences to recover and rest. So, speaking of passive media, it's time to move on to the other media format I've been using non-stop. Film. I've learned that I've had three modes when watching movies, shows, or videos lately. Either I'm so tired or stressed that I need a passive, light distraction to break anxious thought patterns and to feel transported into a nostalgic and safe world, or I'm feeling rested and happy and want something I don't need to pay too close attention to just to maintain my good mood and possibly while I multitask with other enriching hobbies. Or, after resting enough, I look for a psychological challenge that helps me grow, reflect, and process my real life stresses. So, when I've been stressed and need a break, I watch old nostalgic movies that remind me of simpler, more familiar times. These are movies I watched as a kid or a teenager, and so they remind me of when I didn't have as much on my plate. And they're all very light in tone, many of them rom-coms or feel-good movies. And some of them I watch tongue-in-cheek. I think I might be a little weird because I can re-watch movies a lot. I think I never grew out of that stage when you're little where you can re-watch movies all the time. But after looking into media psychology, I learned that I do this for a few reasons. Our media habits when we feel bad are all about mood repair. We use media to feel better. When I watch these movies, I know them from start to finish, and it's because I'm so familiar with them that I feel stable and secure. 
They help me break any anxious thoughts down and let me engage in the recovery process by distancing me from stresses and helping me relax both physically and emotionally since I don't need to do any kind of guesswork about what's going to happen next. I can just sit back and enjoy the old rom-com worlds for their humor and levity. These are all hedonic movies. Every story ever written is on this spectrum of what kind of emotional impact they deliver to audiences and the psychological effect that they have. Hedonic movies are light, fun, and cheery. Although people tend to look down their noses at hedonic movies like these, studies show that they give us important psychological benefits. In fact, research has shown that we need a balanced diet of both comedic hedonic media and the more serious and emotional eudaimonic media, which I'll cover later. Hedonic media steals my attention away from my fear and helps me focus on the blessings in the present moment and the lighter side of life. I reminisce about how simple life was when I first watched them as a kid during summer vacation and in a way, I feel like my brain is trying to revisit that state of mind. I haven't spent this much time at home since I was on a middle school summer vacation. So maybe, unique to my needs, I've been trying to relate to how my younger self passed the time. I have found the nostalgia that these movies inspire very therapeutic. Revisiting my younger self and my thoughts while I watch these movies has helped me build stronger self-continuity, a stronger sense of positive self-regard, and personal history, which feels good psychologically because it reminds us of how meaningful our past and, by extension, our present is. By revisiting my younger self, I can relearn how to relate to the world the way I had when I wasn't so distracted by bills and money and global news. I'm reminded of a time when I could mindfully enjoy sunlight, warm breezes, sitting under trees, and silly movies. Often after watching one of these light nostalgic films, I feel reconnected with myself and inspired to engage in other mindful activities and practice gratitude for simple details that my younger self would have appreciated on a lazy summer day. When I'm in a good mood, I like to throw on media that I can engage in a little bit more. These movies or shows might be newer to me. They offer a little challenge and are mostly entertaining hedonic films again. When we watch media in a good mood, we don't necessarily want something too exciting or absorbing. We don't want to interrupt and replace our current positive feelings. So we watch or play things that are mostly neutral that we can watch with an easygoing attitude. This is also when I tend to watch YouTube. I catch up with my subscriptions and engage with my parasocial relationships with my favorite YouTubers. And don't worry, that's not as creepy as it sounds. The use of the word relationship for this term isn't about an actual relationship. It just means an emotional investment with someone I only know through mediated content and who doesn't interact with me directly back. But it isn't as extreme as celebrity worship, which is the first thing we might think of when we hear that term. In short, a parasocial relationship is the kind of scientific way of describing being a fan of someone and feeling emotionally connected to them, checking back on their content regularly, and everyone has dozens of parasocial relationships. If you have a favorite YouTuber or Twitch streamer or even any favorite characters in movies or books, you almost always have a parasocial relationship with them. I'm writing a whole video about parasocial relationships and what they do for us, but the Quick Notes version is that watching their content adds more stability and security to our lives, helping us feel anchored to a routine time of day when we feel we can share fun or scary experiences with them. And this even gives us a fulfilling and meaningful sense of social connection with not only them, but the others who watch them, all of which is beneficial for both our objective and subjective well-being. In short, what I watch and play while in this headspace, I pick out because I've learned that these pieces of media help me maintain an emotional homeostasis. Neither too challenging to wear down my mental energies that I've already spent a lot of time building up again, but not too familiar and easy to digest that I feel emotionally unproductive or unengaged. Once I've rested enough and enjoyed a good mood for a while, then I might be ready to shake things up. The popular idea is that media is just a tool for us to distract ourselves from real life, an eject button from responsibilities and anxiety. While media can transport us to different worlds, sometimes we choose to go to even scarier worlds or worlds that look just as challenging as our own. This is because media isn't just for distraction and recovery. It's for challenging ourselves and growing too. This might sound drastic. We aren't used to the idea that we can use media for anything other than mindless entertainment. But we also know that sometimes we watch or play something that truly changes how we see the world or how we see ourselves. This kind of media that pushes us to learn, reflect, and grow is typically eudaimonic media. It's serious media with emotionally complex, touching, moving, and meaningful themes. 
I watched Schindler's List again recently, which might seem counterintuitive to watch right now, like why would I do that to myself? But actually, it was very healing to watch and has been one of the most meaningful media encounters I've had during quarantine. When I was feeling particularly rested and resilient, I knew I wanted a reminder of other moments in history of greater pain and suffering. It put my own fears and struggles into perspective, and I was able to work on my empathy muscles, reminding me of the importance of compassion and gratitude. The overall tone of Schindler's List is one that reminds us that people can be decent or even self-sacrificing in the worst situations, and thinking about this fact after seeing so much outrage and negativity in my news feeds, I felt elevated and once again better connected to the rest of the world. I watched Arrival for the same reasons, to be reminded, even through science fiction, that the world is bigger than my fears. It was healing to see the parallels of panic and anxiety and outrage that we see represented in the film in reaction to the alien visitors in parallel to what is happening around us right now. Social cognitive theory tells us that watching people, even fictional people, go through similar scary situations that we're going through right now inspires us to confront the psychological obstacles we're facing, take them apart, and learn from the characters how to put the pieces back together in a meaningful way. Which is why a lot of people have been watching Contagion and other pandemic movies right now, to glean emotional lessons from the stories and feel less alone in their fear. But what I also needed from Arrival was to be guided back to thinking about the things that truly matter, like love, family, and embracing both the joys and sorrows in life indiscriminately as a source of fulfillment. These movies helped me confront important topics in the world or in my life, and the human condition in general. They took a lot of mental energy to engage with, but the reward was a clearer sense of who I am, a revitalized compassion towards the human condition, and a renewed appreciation of my connection to the rest of the world. Okay, putting it all together, what have I learned from practicing this media mindfulness retrospectively on my quarantine media habits? I've learned I watch a lot of TV. That's the first realization we might have when we actually try to track what we've been doing with our screen time. But this doesn't have to be the only takeaway. We should dig a bit deeper and try to figure out what needs we were trying to fulfill and how to be more mindful in the future. Although I was embarrassed by how many movies I had rewatched, I understood that it was the operant conditioning and lack of mindfulness. Since realizing this, I have been checking in with my motivations. When I sit down to watch a nostalgic movie, I remind myself, I want to watch this for the recovery experience and to revisit a nostalgic mindset that boosts my mood and inspires gratitude. When asking myself why I've been watching so much hedonic media, I learned it's because I have a lot of low-level stress, like a constant rumble in the background that I'm trying to deafen. In fact, I hadn't realized it was there until I started looking at my behavior. Knowing this, I've been able to bring that stress to my conscious mind and work through it a little bit and try more direct approaches at soothing it. I've also learned that a film can give you the exact fresh perspective you need on life to buffer anxiety and stress from developing as quickly or deeply as before. In the end, this was just a media mindfulness check-in for the last few weeks, and while it has been an extraordinary few weeks that has led me to some strange media habits that needed analysis, my aim from this is to learn how to more naturally incorporate media mindfulness check-ins at least every week from now on. You've been watching and playing in patterns that are significant to you and your moods and mental states, but I hope a term or an idea popped out for you that might help you discover your own best media mindfulness practices during these strange times so that you can locate how to get some much needed healing, relaxation, and inspiration. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more about the intersection of well-being, positive psychology, and media psychology, please go ahead and subscribe and leave a comment about any games, movies, or psychological ideas you'd like to see covered in the future. Thank you, and as always, happy watching.